This episode of Gather and Go is sponsored by Visit Lincoln. While the days are getting shorter, entertainment and fun take no holidays in Lincoln, Nebraska. Live music, fall-themed outdoor events, and more will make it a season to remember when you bring your group to experience what Lincoln has to offer. Plan your fall trip at lincoln.org and let the Visit Lincoln team make your stay exciting and memorable with group tour itineraries and options for any gathering of people. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to Gather and Go, the podcast that helps you plan, promote, and lead better trips. I'm Brian Jewell. I am your host. I am positively giddy that you decided to spend some of your time with us today. And as always, our promise to you is that we're going to do everything we can to make that investment of your time worth your while. Now, today we're going to do that in a featured conversation with Merrick McEnroth Brewster, who is a tourism marketing expert and the founder of the Von Mack Agency. Uh, We're going to talk about marketing techniques that actually work. Uh, You're going to hear Merrick's thoughts on the human side of travel marketing and get some really practical information about how you can make your travel company stand out in a crowded field. If you are a travel marketer, an aspiring travel marketer, or just trying to figure out how to navigate your way through the myriad options for promoting your travel business, you are going to want to hear this conversation. First, though, let's start with some travel news you may have missed. New cruisers are driving an increase in profitability for Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean Group executives told investors on a recent earnings call that vacationers are spending more on its cruises and that they expect to increase prices for 2025. CEO Jason Liberty said the company's third quarter profits exceeded expectations due to strong demand and growth in onboard revenues. Liberty attributed the growth to multiple factors, including strong results from new customers. He said the majority of Royal Caribbean Group's customers this year were either first-time cruisers or new to the company's brands, and that millennials and families have purchased cruises in greater numbers than previously expected. Now, the company said it expects to see fourth quarter income growth of about 5% over last year, and that 2023 earnings were up around 18% compared to 2019. So far, they said advanced bookings for 2025 are outpacing 2024 levels. Well, now it's time for the road tip segment of our show. This is the part of every episode where we reach deep into our bag of travel knowledge from decades on the road and bring you tips to make your next trip less stressful and more successful. Now, if you ever run into me out on the road, maybe coming or going in a hotel lobby, maybe in transit in an airport somewhere, you might notice that I never have a backpack or a briefcase or a shoulder bag or anything like that strapped across my shoulders. Now, I certainly do travel with a carry-on to uh, carry my laptop and phone chargers and maybe a book or two, some other important things I need. But I learned years ago that the best and most efficient way to carry those things is not strapped across my back where it's putting pressure on my shoulders and uh, compressing my spine, but actually strapped to my main rollerboard suitcase. Now, this is a tip I picked up from watching flight crews move through airports. If you think about it, You have probably never seen a pilot or a flight attendant with a backpack or a briefcase strapped across their shoulders. Instead, what you always see them doing is carrying multiple bags all strapped together to their main rollerboard and pulling the entire bundle behind them as they move through the airport. Well, when I decided to start trying this for myself, it was a game changer. And let me explain to you how this is done. It all comes down to a small piece of equipment called a trolley strap. Now, many pieces of luggage have a trolley strap built in. You may just not notice it uh, if you have uh, a briefcase or a shoulder bag or something like that that is intended for travel. There's a very good chance that there is a fabric panel on the back of that bag that is sewn into uh, either the left or the right side, but is open on the top and the bottom. If you've never uh, stopped to wonder what that 
panel is about, well, that is your trolley strap. That allows you to slide that bag down over the handle of your main rollerboard. Uh, now, if you use a backpack, that's probably not gonna have a trolley strap, but uh, it's pretty easy to rig one uh, using the straps and handles that are already part of your backpack. And of course, there are, are add-on trolley straps that you can buy on Amazon for like $7. They just go around your travel bag and attach to your suitcase. Whichever way you go, this is an amazingly convenient thing to have on hand. So here's how it works. First of all, it's best if you are carrying your main luggage and not checking it. If you check your luggage, you don't have the advantage of a suitcase telescoping handle to use to carry uh, your, your carry-on and all your other things. So uh, this will be most efficient if you are using a carry-on luggage instead of checking. In fact, this is one of the big reasons that I almost always carry on my luggage instead of checking it because I wanna be able to use that trolley strap. So here's how it works. First, you pull out that telescoping handle on your main suitcase to the fully extended position. Then uh, you open up the gap between the main part of your bag and your trolley strap, and then slide it down over that luggage handle so that uh, your handbag is now resting on top of your suitcase, held in place by that trolley strap on the outside of the suitcase handle. And then it makes it super easy. You can just pull everything behind you only with the suitcase handle. Your shoulders aren't involved, your back's not involved, it is really easy. So here are some of the reasons why I like it. Number one, it allows me to carry everything I need with one hand, frees me up to use my other hand for anything else I need. Uh, looking at something on my phone, carrying some food, a bottle of water, it's much easier to do things that way. Uh, I also don't have any strain or pressure on my back or shoulders. And don't you know, the older you get, the more important you realize it is to avoid putting unnecessary strain on those joints and body parts. It also um, makes me move much more intuitively. I don't have to worry about accidentally uh, knocking my backpack or a shoulder bag on the side of me into a person or a piece of furniture or a seat or anything like that. My body moves in the way it moves uh, through normal space in my everyday life. And so I'm not accidentally bopping somebody on the head with my backpack. Another benefit is it makes it really easy to get things in and out of my carry-on. If you have a backpack strapped to your back and you need to get something out of it, well, you have to do that dance where uh, you pull your shoulders and arms out of the straps, you turn the bag around, find some way to prop it up, then open it, then get what you need out, and then reverse the process and put the bag back on. Well, I hate that. But what I love about the trolley strap method is that my bag is instantly accessible. I don't need to take it off to get into it. I just wheel my suitcase around and it is right there in front of me. I unzip it, grab what I need, zip it back up and I'm good to go. And a final thing I love about this is it just makes it much harder to lose or misplace things. If my bag, my briefcase, if you're carrying a purse, whatever you're carrying, if those things are strapped to your main piece of luggage, you're not going to forget them. You're not going to lose them. That is a major benefit. Now there is one caveat of all this that I want to mention. If your carry-on is heavy, if you keep a laptop in there or some other uh, heavy equipment, that extra weight on your rollerboard can put some strain on the arm that is dragging your suitcase bundle behind you. So if this is an issue for you, you can solve the problem by using a spinner style suitcase that allows you to push it along gliding on four wheels instead of dragging it behind you on two wheels. Whether you use that spinner or a traditional two-wheel roll aboard using a trolley strap system is going to make your life much much easier in airports walking down hotel hallways anywhere else that you find yourself dragging a suitcase and a backpack this is going to be a game changer for you i promise that is your road tip of the week now before we move on i want to share just a little bit of news from us if you're new to the program, you may not know that here at the Group Travel Leader, we do much more than just produce the Gather and Go podcast. We are a full travel publishing company with magazines, websites, e-newsletters, lots of resources that you can find incredibly helpful for planning and promoting and leading better trips. And uh, twice a month, we send out the Group Travel Minute. This is our e-newsletter. It contains all the best content from our flagship magazine, The Group Travel Leader, plus lots of other stuff 
that you won't see if you only listen to the podcast or subscribe in print. Over the past couple of months, some of those exclusive pieces of content have included articles about how to plan food for diverse diets among your travel group. Uh, We had an FAQ for new group travel planners. We had a great article on planning group bachelorette parties. We had a story about optimizing group trips for different generations in your community and a great piece of content on preparing for travel emergencies. Now, if you subscribe to the Group Travel Minute, you are going to get content like that twice a month, and it is absolutely free. All you need to do is go to grouptravelleader.com slash subscribe. You can sign up right there. I'll put that link in the show notes. And when you do, you will start receiving the Group Travel Minute twice a month, absolutely free. You're going to find this resource invaluable. So go to grouptravelleader.com slash subscribe and get your name on that list right now. Well, now it is just about time for us to get into our featured conversation with Merrick and McEnroth Brewster. Before we do, though, let me remind you, you can find a wrap up of the most important things we talked about anytime by accessing the show notes for this episode. Show notes are simply the text that appears right below the media player in your favorite podcasting app or on our website, wherever you are listening. And after the interview, I'm going to come back and do a quick wrap up of some of the most important things America and I talked about just to make sure that you don't miss some of these super helpful marketing insights. Now, let me encourage you to stick around to the end of that wrap up, because afterwards, I'm going to discuss how much you should rely on social media for marketing your travel business. That's going to be the topic of today's hot minute. You won't want to miss it. We'll be right back with Merrick and McEnroth Brewster. All right, everybody, I want to take a minute to tell you about our sponsor, Lincoln, Nebraska. From intimate venues that amplify local talent to large stages that host renowned artists, the live music scene in Lincoln offers a diverse range of genres and atmospheres. Visit the iconic Pinewood Bowl, one of the most talked about outdoor venues in the region. Pinnacle Bank Arena plays host to national touring acts, while the Bourbon Theater, Zoo Bar, and Duffy's host incredible shows in the middle of Lincoln's downtown music scene. Winter markets are just around the corner, including Wax Buffalo's Winter Market held on December 8th. Meanwhile, Roca Berry Farm offers outdoor fall delights just south of Lincoln near the town of Roca. Outdoor patios and bars galore will give you great views of the city, including at the Scarlet Hotel, which features the Barred Owl and their patio overlooking UNL's city campus. Plan your visit today with a team from Visit Lincoln at lincoln.org. All right, everybody. My guest today is a veteran tourism marketer who got her start promoting Louisiana Swamp Tours in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. After working in various roles through the industry, she started the Von Mack Agency, which provides full-service marketing support for tourism organizations. She's a frequent speaker at universities around New Orleans, as well as travel industry organizations, including Arrival and the National Tour Association. American McEnroth Brewster, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's a joy to be here. I am so excited to have you here. Uh, Your story is fascinating from the very beginning because um, I think of Katrina as almost destroying tourism in Louisiana, especially for a while. It actually kind of opened a door for you to get into the industry. So tell us a little bit of that story. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have to look for the silver lining. So I think that that is hopefully the story across the board. I mean, it was a terrible um, occurrence, but, you know, you you have to look to the other side. So, um, yeah. Got my start. I'm from New Orleans, you know, born and raised. And I was always into marketing, advertising, you know, blinders on in that situation. And as soon as I graduated, I got this amazing job, you know, at a a marketing agency, downtown, high office, that sort of thing. And then three months later, Hurricane Katrina landed into New Orleans and the entire agency just got up and moved away all the way to Georgia and seeing as though I was the lowest on the totem pole and had just been hired, um, I got to stay behind and, and I didn't get to go with them. So uh, yeah, from that point, just you know, moved from agency to agency. There was this vacuum that happened here afterwards in terms of talent and in terms mm-hmm. of, you know, if you 
wanted to be here. You wanted to be here and you worked to be in this city. And that connected a lot with tourism because we needed people to come to the city to put money back into the economy and to get things going. So that's how I got my start. I, you know, by and large, ended up on these tourism accounts, uh, you know, through for the the state and for the city, you know, paid by, you know, taxpayer funding and, you know, got right behind, you know, the computer learning paid search. And, you know, I remember literally bidding on any word that had anything to do with the city. You know, you know, if you if you type for uh, red beans back in the day, 2005, I was the one on the other side going, Red beans, we have those in New Orleans, come visit us. You know, like those are the ads. So, you know, anything and everything to remind people that we were here and that we wanted visitation. Because I think that that's one of those things where, you know, if there is something that happens in this industry, if there is a hurricane, if there's an earthquake, if there's COVID, you know, there's this trepidation for travelers. They don't really know what to do. They don't know what the right thing is to do. Mm. And they're they're yearning for you to tell them. So the welcoming aspark, aspect of that part was huge. And that was just how I, you know, dove in and, and got my feet wet with tourism and marketing from the very beginning. So in that period post Katrina, you were, you were getting some experience that a lot of digital marketers don't necessarily get, you know, you just weren't working the keywords and, uh, and trying to, to figure out SEO and, and Google and maybe some of the very early advertising on social. I don't remember exactly when that started, but you also got to see how sales works uh, and not just the marketing side. So w- tell us some of the things you learned from those early experiences uh, where you got to meet your visitors on site or got to go to some tourism conferences and, and kind of experience that side of the business. Yeah, so it's and it's very different. I learned that quickly <laughs> being on the inside and the outside of it. So after working in agency in the agency space for a couple of years after Katrina, I um, then mentioned I had moved from agency to agency. There was this vacuum and there was all this opportunity. And I was like, oh, I'll go here and learn this. Oh, I can have a desk. I'm going to do that. Well, there were, you know, obviously lots of tourism entities in this area in New Orleans, swamp tour providers, you know, steamboat provider, all, all of that. You know, the, every, everyone was getting back on their feet. Um, and a lot of people needed marketing. A lot of businesses need marketing. So there was this uh, swamp tour agency that had actually, I had worked with doing paid search with one agency I was at. And when I moved to another one, um, they followed me there to do paid search as well. And then after a while, they they asked me to to come on board with them. So I joined, I, I found myself driving from New Orleans to the swamp every morning, you know, an hour <laughs> north, which you just don't expect. Um, and, you know, it was, it was, it was beautiful. It was these, you know, these little boats and all, and it was, it was, it was building. So from that point on, um, you know, I learned that it's not just inviting, you know, someone through a website to, to come visit. It's not just putting marketing out there. There's this B2B aspect that is huge. This networking component that, you know, you either know about it or you don't, you know, and luckily I was invited into it. Um, by just networking and going to tourism events in New Orleans, in the community. And someone at, at one point told me, you know, you have to go to these shows. You have to go, you have to get, you know, placed on these series. You have to have a profile sheet. You have to do, 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 And I was like, tell me about this. What is happening here? So I actually went to lunch with a couple of people from, you know, other spaces and and they they laid it out for me. And I was like, well, this is huge. So I went to my boss at the time and was like, we need to do this. You know, this is this is the next level. We need We need to go after this type of, traveler, we need to go after the series. We need to network. We need to make these partnerships at the top level and get a booth and all that stuff. And so I just dove in head first and, um, you know, everyone was very welcoming. That was something that I really love about tourism. And I think maybe just want to stay in it for this past 20 years, because it is once you know, you know, right. Yeah. Once, once you're there, you're, you're there. So that's where, because I had a marketing brain, you know, I kind of put it all together and was like, okay, well, there's, let's figure out peak rates, non-peak rates, you know, mm-hmm. let's figure out what, how, how is it easy to sell? You know, do we have parking? Do we have bus parking? That sort of thing. And that's where, you know, you eventually build out your, your group page on your website and it just goes hand in hand and it builds from there. So, um, that was definitely something that, you know, built over time as well. Yeah. Was it one of those situations where the people you were working for were, um, their expertise was in operating swamp tours, you know, operating the vessels, you know, making people smile or teaching them things on the boats. And, and they were such a small organization. They didn't have the bandwidth or hadn't really thought about, oh, we could branch out into the the group tour space and, and get booths at events and, you know, put out uh, marketing materials. I feel like there's, there are so many kind of solopreneurs in our space that they don't even think about this stuff because they're so busy just with the daily 
execution of their core business. Was it that sort of thing? In, well, I was very lucky at that time to to work for a swamp for company that had very business minded people at the helm. So they were very growth minded. I, I'm sure that they were aware of it, but I wasn't I wasn't in the understanding that they thought it would have been necessarily worth it or not. I think they had dipped their toes in it and it was just like, yeah, you know, what's the return? I think that there are folks at the helm for many of the small tour company providers and the small tourism company providers that don't even know about it. And then there are ones that have heard about it like this in this case, but they didn't really understand what the return would be or, you know, what what they needed to put together to make it a return. Um, because there's so much business there that is waiting, you know, to be sent through it. I feel like the ones that send the series through are looking for something that is new and, you know, something that is culturally unique. And, you know, and, and it's those providers that we have to kind of connect in, in between to uh, open that space. Yeah. So you mentioned return, and that is something that anybody who's thinking about marketing should be looking at, right? But it's it's incredibly difficult to measure, uh, especially when you're not doing, say, you know, paid search or or paid social, where you're just kind of you know plastering your identity, your brand awareness out there as many places as you can, and then you see, well, I got this many sales at the end of the month. Are, are there some ways that you tell your tourism clients? Uh, that they can measure that return that isn't just from Google Analytics or, or something so cut and dried. Yeah, that's actually something that I, huh, that's something that we we work to gain headway on each and every day. You know, there's there's two mindsets to it. There's there's the ones where, you know, it's very sales focused and it's how many leads did you get from the show, da, 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 da. And then the marketing side, it's, you know, what is, you know, cost per acquisition? What is the click-through rate? What, you know, all, all, all of it gets down to the percentages. Uh, for me, I think it has to be a holistic view. Mm -hmm. I think you have to look at Lyft year over year in terms of where your business is coming from and where the interest is coming from. And I think it's, it's you know, multi-layered in terms of uh, feeder markets as well as hyper local. So it's one of those things where it should be something that, you know, builds on top of itself and you should know, okay, well, you know, the the Florida region and in Houston, if you're in New Orleans, they're always going to be sending people here because, you know, they have usually by and large, they have relatives here and it's going to be like that in, you know, any sort of location. So I think that you need to have a holistic view and you need to look at your business growth year over year and, you know, figure out where your sales and your marketing spend is attributing to that um, monetarily. And you have to give yourself a little bit of leeway there. And that's where I see an issue with, you know, some people when they first start marketing or first start sales, uh, they want to get it down to the penny. And mm. unfortunately, in my experience, because it's holistic, it's, it's, I don't think it's possible to do to get it down to the penny because getting, you, you have to understand brand lift. You have to understand, you know, being top of mind for people and all of that, that, that definitely counts towards it. So, you know, your social media posts down to going to the shows, that's going to attribute to building a community that may not purchase this year, but it will down the line. So you have to get those percentages into view and give yourself that little bit of room, that wiggle room there. Yeah. I feel like there are a lot of people coming out of college right now with their bachelor's in marketing, getting their first jobs in tourism. And there's a high probability that all they have ever been taught was digital. Paid acquisition, yes. keywords, social. Uh, you came up through a, a similar kind of system uh, that I grew up in, which was very relational. And there was a lot of one-on-one -on -one selling happening in person at events, you know, over appointments or coffees or cocktails or things like that. What would you tell a brand new tourism marketer right now about how they should view the mix of digital versus all that other old fashioned stuff? The old fashioned stuff is coming back. Hmm. I actually just did a, a speech on this, a session on this at uh, the arrival conference uh, about a month ago, where um, explaining to folks that in the marketing and advertising community nationally um, at all of these conferences, there's it's a big movement, actually. It's, it's a big documented movement to go back to creative, back to the old school. And the reason for that is because you have two things happening, right? You have AI that has come into the mix very recently, hmm. and it's doing all these wonderful things and facilitating all of this great marketing and all of this great messaging for some of the small providers, as well as agency spaces, they're using it too. But sometimes if you get lazy with AI or if you don't put that human element, that creative element into it, it can make the creative homogenous. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. You're looking at ads and they all look like one another because they're all AI generated or the, all the imagery is, a, you know, it's all the same, right? So you have that happening on one side. On the other side, you have this rise of performance marketing, digital marketing, this marketing with the expectation of exact numbers down to the penny. And that has arisen, you know, probably in the past five to seven years where it's like, okay, well, you can set this pixel and this pixel will do all this stuff for you on Facebook or Ibenna and, you know, set this pixel and, and Google and, it'll, you know, just launch it, let it go. You know, and it's, it's more the other side of the brain. It's math. It's all of those, you know, data-based sets, right? And so that was running, 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 running. But now you have the, you know, the cookies, you know, issue where the tracking is not, you know, you know, privacy. So all the privacy things that have happened, the limitations, I believe it was about a year and a half ago, uh, iPhone did an update on their phone where it just allows you to press a button and opt out of all the tracking. You know, you can opt out of all this tracking now. So what that means is that number one, your ads are not, the pixel isn't shooting it to as um, explicit of audience as it was before, because you have all these people who aren't being tracked and giving you those data points, as well as the targeting available on our end as marketers on meta on google and programmatic all that all that space that's being dialed back as well because you can't go to such a distinct level because there's so many people that are not giving you those data points right so you have homogeny on one side and then on the other side you have you know the the loss of all of this targeting so that just leads to this big gray area so at the end of the day what i'm getting towards is the movement towards creative means have to get back to the basics you have to get back to the books, the old school, the foundational principles of marketing, which means your creative has to be good. You have to know your unique selling points. You have to know why you're different than the guy down the street. Whatever kind of tourism industry representative you are, you need to know why someone would take your tour or the tour next to you or visit your destination or with the other guy. What, what is the why? And then you have to have that human element into it to kind of have your ads wherever they are, whether they're print, digital, what have you. They have to break through the space. They have to... Um, There's expectation now that you people want to be entertained. Social media has done that. So you need to work harder on your creative and it has to build on itself. And it's, in my opinion, a lot more difficult in terms of tourism marketing as a whole, because it's not a car master. You're not going after that repeat visitor over and over and over again. You're really trying to inspire something new and you wear a human, wear a human, you know, trade. That's what we do. We sell culture. So there has to be that human element to it. So you can't just be performance. You have to be across the board. Yeah. So uh, it occurs to me that I know that I have been geofenced before when I've been at an event, you know, uh, I open my phone and all of a sudden I'm getting ads for things that are related to tourism or uh, I have lunch with a buddy and he's talking about, he, you know, he may want to propose to his girlfriend soon. And then somehow I'm getting ads from jewelry companies. Yes. I think a lot of people feel a little bit icky about that. There's something creepy about it. We know what's going on. We still don't like it. What I hear you describing is is almost a much more explicit thing of like, hey, I know we're all at the same event, so let's embrace it and, and find a way to market around that. Do you have, have some strategies for doing this in a, a human way that people embrace instead of you know, turning them off? It is such a double-edged sword and you have to really, really think about how you're going to show up in the feeds. And that's exactly what I'm, what I'm speaking to in terms of letting your pixel just run. I've never been a proponent of that. I've always been old school because it's like, no, that's it's going to be jutting no matter what you do. So, you know, we do lots of different types of, of social campaigns across the board, whether it's B2B or B2C. And first and foremost, the biggest thing you have to think about is your targeting. So when you go to the shows, the targeting is theoretically easier because you'll have, you can target the convention center or the hotel it's in and then layer in with, with you know, people who are interested in tourism or what have you. Um, if you are B2C and you're trying to target people coming into town or what have you, um, then you really have to get down to, you know, put on your, your psychological hat and go, what are the brands these people follow? And are they planning travel? And, you know, what are, the, you know, the magazine that, and really get to it in an old school fashion. And the reason I'm saying that is because if you get really, really, really good at that aspect of it, the targeting, then when it shows up in the feeds, it feels less icky, regardless mm-hmm. of how you're putting it out there or what you're putting it out there for. And that's really the trick to it. That's That's the clever aspect of it, that you want to make sure your targeting is so good that when it comes into someone's feed and you're entertaining them with whatever it is, you know, whatever piece of content it is, they're thankful for it. I mean, I don't mm. know about you, but I've I've had moments where, you know, I've, it's a Friday night. My kids are in bed. I've had a glass of wine and I, I'm looking on, you know, Meta or Instagram and I'm served an ad for a, 
sweater. And I'm like, that's a great sweater. Next thing I know, you know, two mornings later, I got the sweater on my porch and I'm <laughs> thankful for it. Yeah. You know, I'm like, this is awesome. So it really has to come down to that connection and knowing your audience. Yeah. Um, for the clients, we'll do something where, you know, if they have a booth, um, we did this for a motor coach client. We, we love the motor coach family. They, they did, um, an interactive component where, you know, you spun the wheel and, and you win something, but, you know, then you can opt in for something even bigger, uh, you know, a draw at the last day. And so we were posting each and every day about the people who had, you know, gone into the wheel and, you know, and how they entered each day and, you know, kind of updates. And we promoted it each and every day to everyone coming to the show until the last day. It was building up that suspense. Come meet us at our booth. You know, so you need another component of it, it optimally to kind of be the driver of the message. So you have to have the targeting right. You have to have the driver. And then you have to you have to put your face on it. You have to yeah. be like, it's me, it's me. And it, mm. it, it works. So it has to be personal. It has to be personal. Yeah. Yes. What about that tour operator who uh, is advertising? They're basically B2C. You know, they are uh, a tour operator based, let's say, in Lexington, Kentucky, where I live. And they're trying to get a bunch of people from Kentucky to go on their tour to New Orleans. Uh, do you have any specific tips for them, you know, beyond, again, just try to play the Google keyword game or, or anything like that? Are there ways to make themselves stand out in what I would imagine is a very crowded field of keywords, you know, around like New yeah. Orleans tourism? How, how do you do that in a way that's going to grow your passenger count? Absolutely. Um, so I'm glad you hit on the competition there, first and foremost, because a lot of people, especially, you know, students, we, we work a lot with students as well, um, you know, and, and sharing and thought share. Um, there's this connotation that tours and marketing is easier because it's fun and you're selling the fun and who would, who doesn't want to do the fun things, right? Who doesn't like vacation? In my experience, it's a lot more difficult. Um, number one, because you're trying to get that first timer across the line over, you know, over and over again. And that's, if anyone has ever done marketing, it's way more difficult to get the first time sell than a repeat sell. Mm -hmm. We're doing that a lot. Um, secondly, the competition, as you mentioned, you're not just competing against usually when you're in tourism, it's a saturated market. It's, you know, it's, you know, condensed down into these certain sort of cities a lot of, a lot of times. So the cities, the tourism cities, you know, there's lots of swamp tours. There's lots of zip lines in, you know, certain areas. There's lots of water sports in other areas. You're competing against all of those. So your you unique sign for proposition, your, your point of difference has to be huge, but you're also competing against everything else in the world. You're competing <laughs> against walking down the beach with your family. You're competing against visiting grandma. You're competing against going to the free park. You're competing against everything. It is not easy, you guys. I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and say it's it's, you know, a walk in the park like I just mentioned, but it's it's so worth it, right? It's it's this lifestyle. So to do that effectively, um to compete against grandma, bring grandma, what have you. Um you know, you want to double down. And I keep saying that a lot, but it's when you go in silos, in marketing or in sales, you're leaving you're leaving all sorts of money on the table, right? Mm. So what I recommend is doing a combination of a few things. I recommend meta ads. Usually, it, it I'm starting to see some brands that can just go into TikTok or just go into other spaces, um, but it's usually you know some people will say, oh, people don't go into Facebook anymore. They don't use Instagram anymore. They do. They do. They don't admit they do, but they definitely do. I definitely do. <laughs> They might just have an account to log into other things, but they have that account, right? And those yeah. ads can follow them. So it's usually a combination of meta as well as Google ads. Um, those two with some other ones sprinkled in depending on what it is. Um, and what we do is we work on the decision-making, you know, funnel, you know. So sometimes it'll say we start in the feeder city markets where, you know, as I had mentioned, Houston or what have you for New Orleans, there's always the top two or three feeder cities, we call it planting the seed. We'll plant the seed there. We'll do our targeting super, super, super well, and we'll plant the seed, anyone who's interested in your locale. And when we put ads out there, they're usually informational. It's usually a give. So it's, mm. we're entertaining you, or here's a video, or here's you know something that is not asking you to do something with a promo code. Because by and large, you're not going to purchase something that you know is under, let's say, $150 that far ahead in time. But you're planting the seed, right? Once you do that, especially if you do a video on Meta, you can retarget to that person, anyone who's watched that video for like two seconds. So what we do is we retarget them down the funnel. So when they get into the drive market, we have a drive market we segment, and then we have hyperlocal, which we 
very largely put a lot of budget in. And so we will retarget people all the way down that funnel. And when they go in, when they fall into the drive market, and then when they fall into hyperlocal, the ads themselves on Google and in Meta get more conversion driven. Um, and they go from engagement to here's a promo code, two spots left. You know, back when, when they're in town, that's what they see. So you follow them all the way through giving the, this content. And then if they're thinking about it and they're like, oh, I'm going to go look in Google. I'm going to search for, you know, haunted tour, blah, blah, blah. You're you're there as well because you're retargeting to the same audience, right? You're, you yeah. have your retargeting set up. And so you catch them there as well. You remind them that you're the same company. You're you're the tour or you're the attraction provider that does this. This is my, this is why I'm different. You're not just going to a restaurant. You're not just going to a swamp tour. You're going to the swamp tour that does this. And so it's it's really easy to lose to your competition that way if your unique selling point isn't differentiated enough. So we work with our clients a lot on that. But it is, it's, it's a very um, calculated marketing directive to get them all the way down that funnel. Um, but it works. We found that it works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, um, my impression of many people in the tourism uh, community who are kind of solopreneurs, mom and pop shops, I see them kind of go two ways when it comes to marketing. Well, three ways. One group just doesn't do it because, you know, word of mouth or location or whatever kind of takes care of it for them. Another group says, oh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, I, I use those so I can figure this out myself. And, and then they try and, and the results are almost always abysmal, right? Like hugely disappointing and you've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and you got no leads. Then there's the approach that says, uh, this sounds so complicated. There's no way I'm going to try. I need to bring in some experts. Lots of possibility there, but I know there are also marketing agencies who are happy to take your money and are never going to produce the kind of results you need because they don't have any tourism expertise. So how do you recommend to people to navigate those tricky waters of saying, when, when can I do this marketing myself with some Googling and some good advice? Or when is it time to think about and maybe budget for hiring outside help? Um, I would say, you know, we do, we do partner a lot with companies that start out that way. You know, they'll do their own social, they'll do their own Google ads, or they'll get a nephew to do whatever what have you. Um, sometimes they're pretty decent. Um, most of the time it's, you know, we could come in and we can kind of charge things up a lot. At the end of the day, I think you need to do what you can and follow your gut and watch your numbers. So if you have your nephew doing it or doing it yourself um, and you don't know your return, <laughs> then stop. Mm -hmm. Stop and focus on that first. Like, you know, say I, you know, set some goals and be like, OK, well, I want to get 20 percent of sales from this Google Ads campaign. And I'm going to know that it's from Google Ads. So I'm going to put a promo code and I'm going to track that. Like that's, you You need to know your numbers, right? Um, if you don't, don't spend time on advertising, spend time on your numbers. Mm. When it gets to um, moving to an agency and knowing when to do that and who to do that with, um, it's when you feel, I say this as a business owner, I, it's probably a better phrasing, but overwhelmed. When you feel mm. overwhelmed, when you feel like there's just, you know, you're spinning too many plates, you know, you have business, but you're not sure where it's coming from and you're not sure where to move forward from, you know, in the best manner to get the biggest return, you know, because usually you don't just offer one type of tour or one type of trip or one type of excursion or, you know, one type of series. It's it's usually varied. Um, you have to get to the point as to where you're, you're mostly booked or you have a decent amount of bookings to continue to, you know, cover your overhead, but you want to know what to grow and how to grow it. And you'll get to that point. You'll know it. You'll know that social is the last thing on your mind or, you know, you don't want to touch the Google ads. And that's usually where we come in. So we come in with smaller to mid-sized entities, uh, DMOs, CVBs, tour companies, attractions, and we kind of make sense of it all um, where it's like, okay, let's do a spreadsheet. What are your buys? Let's, let's, let's set some goals. Let's figure out, you know, historically, let's look at your stats. Let's look at your Google analytics. You know, if you have any coupons, res systems, all of that, and then we make a plan. Okay, we're going to optimize this. We're going to cut that. We're going to spend this much in digital, this much in brand lift, and just really kind of make a plan. I think it's important to make sure that you have some footing um, before you get to an agency space because you need to know what to expect. When you are just starting out and you're just doing social on your own, um, the world, the world, it could be anything. You know, the world is your oyster. So um, I wouldn't recommend, in, unless you really want to go hard on it and you have the cash to do the testing, um, not to go for it right off the bat because 
it it does also put the agency in a space where it's like, well, what what would you like explicitly for me to you know provide for you, sales or sales? But for me, as a marketing agency provider, I want to know what type of sales. I want to know logistically because I've worked on the tour side, right? Logistically, yeah. it matters. You don't want to just group on it all. I mean, can your team handle that? That's yeah. a big component of it as well. Um, so just knowing, being able to pay for something, being able to know that you need to grow, but need a little bit help in the where to grow. Um, and then specifically finding an agency that knows the tourism space. Because again, e-commerce is not the same. You're not going after the repeat customer over and over and over again. Seasonality is a big thing. Shoulder seasons, all mm. of that. You need you need an agency that understands that and can speak that as well. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I could pick your brain about this stuff all day. I do want to make sure our listeners uh, learn a little bit more about Von Mack Agency and the kinds of services you offer. So give us a quick overview of the work you're doing and how you can help people. Sure. Thank you. Um, so Von Mack, we are full service. We've been around for about seven years and we focus directly on tourism. That's all we do. So we work with tour providers, attractions, DMOs, as I've mentioned, anything in the tourism space, but only in the tourism space. Um, and we're full service. So usually we'll just jump in and do strategy. We do a lot of strategy, a lot of consulting, a lot of workshops, and then we come up with a plan and then we work with our clients to add things to the plan and make it a full marketing momentum to either do, you know, Google ads and digital ads. Sometimes we do full branding. Sometimes we'll do branding and a website and launch it with all of this stuff. So it really depends on where you are. But we do it all across the board um, and we consider ourselves a, a partner to grow with. You know, um, most of our clients actually open several companies in the tourism space uh, because that's just how we apparently work as a, you know, an industry. We like to just yeah. own it all, which is awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah. Fantastic. Uh, we have um, workbooks online. We have, you can reach us at Von Mac Agency, Von Mac Agency .com. Um, And we have a, um, a whole section on education and workbooks that are free downloads. So, if you want one where you can walk through um, learning what your brand pop proposition is, your unique selling proposition, brand angling, social media, putting that out, um, just to kind of get your feet, you know, in feet wide in the water, we have those as well, and they're free. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put links to uh, all that in the show notes. Is there any social platform that is the best place for people to follow you and uh, hear what you're thinking about or the things that you find interesting? Well, we're on all of them. Um, uh, so I, I absolutely would love for anyone to follow along um, at Von Mac Agency, V-O-N-M-A-C-K Agency um, on all of them. Instagram, we do a lot of really fun stuff. We do a lot of experimental stuff, uh, prepare to laugh and think we're ridiculous because we all. Um, but there's <laughs> lots of learning and thought shared too. Um, we're also on Facebook and LinkedIn um, and TikTok. So um, you can follow along with us there as well. Yeah, wonderful. We'll include links to all of those things. Now, before we let you go, we have some questions we ask every guest and these are just for fun. So no pressure. You can just answer off the top of your head. Uh, when you book travel, do you reserve a window seat or an aisle seat? I book Southwest, uh, but <laughs> window seat, window seat, because I need, I need to move away from that anyway. It gives me anxiety. But yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. So what's something in your carry on that you wouldn't travel without? Snacks. I'm a mom. I, I said that really aggressively. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have three kids. <laughs> so snacks, all the snacks. And for me as well, usually chocolate. Yes. Yeah. How old are your kids? Um, I have, well, my daughter just turned two uh, yesterday, actually. And I have a six-year-old and a 12-year-old. So wow. yeah, cross the yeah. board. You're like hitting at all the different levels, like, like uh, you know, toddler, uh, elementary school, middle school. That's, uh, that's impressive. Yes. That, that's enough to keep you busy for sure. Yes, absolutely. So, now, if you had a free airline pass and a week with nothing else to do, where would you head next? There's so many places I want to go. Is it, uh, I guess I don't know if I can ask with, with my family or not. I mean, yeah, uh, you, you can take them if you want. Uh, Europe, we're just a big, I, I never visit just one place. I like to get the most out of it, obviously. Um, so we're planning, as soon as my daughter's able to be on a plane in a manner that I can handle her, uh, a little bit <laughs> older, uh, we, we were planning a big, um, we call them our Griswold trips, but our, a big Griswold Euro trip. That, that's yeah. going to happen next. Yeah, awesome. Well, here's a somewhat related question. Uh, what is one thing you have seen or done on the road that you wish you could go back and experience again with somebody you love? Uh, yeah. So I was, at, I was at one conference, I think about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and uh, one of the night events was thrown by Atlas Obscura, which I'm a big fan of anyway, because yeah. I'm just a fan of the, the interesting and weird. 
And um, the night party was in this underground bunker, this 1950s underground bunker. And being from New Orleans, anything underground is like, whoa, because, you know, <laughs> automatically I think water. So right. uh, it was it was the coolest. I went home and told my family about it. So I think maybe maybe we need to travel underground some more. I don't know, but that would be something I would share. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Marike, it's been wonderful having you here. Thank you so much and uh, look forward to seeing you out on the road. Absolutely. You as well. Thanks again. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that conversation with Marika McEnroth Brewster. I hope you learned some things. And hey, I've got to tell you, my interview with Marika was so good and so informative that we just let the tape roll and talk. And I ended up with so much more content than I could use on the program. Now, I have good news for you. You can access that entire interview on our YouTube channel. See it uncut from start to finish. Now, in this full interview on YouTube, you're going to get tips for marketing to tour operators. You're going to hear America talk about how to combine targeted online marketing with in-person interactions at events. You're going to hear her advice for marketing scams you should avoid. And we're going to talk some about how the tourism community can support areas affected by natural disasters. Now, the link to that YouTube video is in the show notes for this episode, or you can simply go to YouTube and search for the channel Gather and Go. Now, I want to take a minute to review a few of the things that Merica said because I found them so helpful, especially if you are a tourism entrepreneur trying to get your feet wet in the marketing space. These are tips you want to take note of. Now, when we were talking about digital marketing versus conventional marketing, Merica said the old fashioned stuff is coming back. In the marketing and advertising community nationally, it's a big documented movement to go back to creative and back to the old school. She said, this means your creative has to be good. You have to know your unique selling points. You have to know why you're different from the guy down the street. You need to know why someone would take your tour over the tour next to you. And then you have to have that human element in your ads. Well, I think America is exactly right here. You know, consumers in general have become wise to the ways of digital marketing. We know when we're being marketed to on social media. We know when we're being targeted on Google. And I don't think it's as effective as it was, let's say, 10 years ago when it just all seemed like magic. What is effective, what has actually always been effective, is great, smart, targeted advertising. That means great creative. Creative in this context simply means the artwork in your ads. You need to have ads that catch people's attention, whether that's in print, online, in an audio format, even in the emails you send. You need to spend some time or some resources coming up with really solid creative that drives your unique selling points home and makes people understand why they should trust you with their money instead of somebody else. Now, when we were talking about how to market in a crowded field, America said there's a connotation that tourism marketing is easier because it's fun and you're selling fun. In my experience, it's a lot more difficult because you're trying to get that first timer across the line over and over again. It's way more difficult to get the first time sell than a repeat sell. She went on to say tourism is a saturated market. Your unique selling proposition and point of difference have to be huge because you're also competing against everything else in the world. She said to do that effectively, you want to double down. When you go in silos and marketing or sales, you're leaving all sorts of money on the table. So I recommend doing a combination of a few things. Now, if I could just expand that and unpack it a little bit, I think when she talks about going in silos, she means saying, I'm only going to go with one method of advertising one method of sales or promotions. And that can be tempting, especially when you are a solopreneur, when you're just starting out and you know that this one area is working for you. And hey, that might work for you for now. Uh, selling in person might work for now. Instagram ads might work for now. Google keywords might work for now. But America's point is that you don't know what other avenues might also work well for you unless you try them. That means trying a mix of digital and conventional advertising. It means trying a mix of different channels within each of those categories. 
It also means experimenting with your ad copy, with your creative, with your images. You're never finished with your marketing plan. It always has to evolve. If you don't evolve it, there's a very good chance you're leaving money on the table. Now, when we talked about the decision-making funnel and how to reach customers at different points in that funnel, Merica said, when we're planting the seed, we're going to do ads that are informational. It's something that is a give and not asking you to do something with a promo code. She said, if you do a video on Meta, you can retarget to that person, to anyone who has watched that video for two seconds. So we retarget people all the way down the funnel, and then the ads get more conversion-driven. They go more from engagement to here's a promo code, two spots left. Now, what Merica is describing here is a really well-known concept in sales and marketing uh, that is described as a funnel. The wide top of your funnel are people who are being exposed to your brand for the first time. And the narrow bottom of the funnel are people who are actually going to go all the way through and convert into paying customers. I think this is a super insightful point she's making your top of funnel advertising should be only informational. In other words, people who are encountering you or your company, your brand or your concept for the first time are almost never going to buy off that first interaction. So don't make that first interaction something that is an ask, something where you are asking them to trust you, do business with you, give you their money. Instead, make it something that is a gift, something you are offering for them that is Educational, informational, entertaining, something that simply makes their life better. If you do that, then you can go back and retarget to people who responded positively to that and lead them down through the sales funnel till they eventually become paying customers. Great stuff there from America McEnroth Brewster. Well, since we've been talking about tourism, marketing, and advertising today, I thought we should close the program by spending a little bit of time investigating selling specifically on social media. Of course, you know you can uh, target people either through organic posts or through promoted posts and advertising on Facebook, Instagram, uh, X, just about any platform you can imagine. But it's worth asking whether that is the best approach. Well, we're going to do that in today's Hot Minute. Yeah, that's right. The Hot Minute is the portion of the program where I take 60 seconds to give you my unfiltered views on an issue that impacts tourism every day. And today we're going to ask the question, how much should you rely on social media to market your travel business? So let's put 60 seconds on the clock and get into it. All right. Social media can be an amazing marketing tool, but if you're not careful, it can also expose you to unexpected risks. I learned this the very hard way earlier this year when my Facebook account was hacked. Even though I reported the hack within a few minutes, it was too late. Facebook closed my account for good. Now you don't have to look hard to find similar stories. And the worst ones come from business owners who relied on social media to market their companies. It's important to remember that you don't own your social accounts. The big tech companies do. You could lose them at any time for any reason. If that happened to you, would your business survive? My advice is never rely too heavily on social media. Whenever possible, encourage people to join your email list. And above all, focus on nurturing your most important relationships in person. Well, that's the hot minute. That's how I see things anyway. Of course, as always, you're welcome to disagree with me and we can still be friends. And hey, whether you agree or disagree, we would love to hear from you. You can send your thoughts, questions, or your rants about big tech companies to podcast at grouptravelleader.com. I read every email that comes into that address. I love hearing from you. And hey, you never know. Your ideas might be the topic of the next hot minute. And while you're in the mood to give us some feedback, could you do me a big favor? Would you go to your favorite podcast playing app? And if you haven't already subscribed to the show, do it there. While you're there, if you could leave us a rating, give us a review. Those are super helpful. And I am so thankful to everyone who has done that so far. My thanks as well to Merica McEnroth Brewster for joining us today. On the next episode of Gather and Go, 
I'm going to bring you a conversation with Brent Dalrymple of Sunrise Tours. He's going to explain all about why traditional motor coach tours aren't going anywhere. That's a conversation you definitely won't want to miss. Until then, though, remember this. At the end of the day, we're all on this trip together, so let's make it a good one. See you next time on Gather and Go. Gather and Go is hosted and executive produced by me, Brian Jewell. Our publisher is Mac Lacey. Donya Simmons is our creative director. Ashley Ricks is our circulation manager and graphic designer. Our sales team is Kyle Anderson and Talisa Reck. To advertise on the podcast, call Talisa at 859-253-0455. Gather and Go is a production of The Group Travel Leader. For more information about our magazines, podcasts, and events, visit us online at grouptravelleader.com. Today's episode was sponsored by Visit Lincoln. Lincoln is known for its unique museums. The University of Nebraska State Museum, Morrill Hall, is one of the nation's top natural history museums, letting visitors experience Nebraska's history through fossils, rocks, exhibits, and hands-on activities. The International Quilt Museum, the American Historical Society of Germans from Russia, and the National Museum of Roller Skating all call Lincoln home as well. Plan your next trip at lincoln.org.